Are you feeling stuck, lost, tired, or uninspired? We've all been there, including myself. I'm Coach Des, mindset motivator and lifestyle entrepreneur. I'm here to tell you that the best, unapologetic, and limitless version of yourself is yet to come. The Born Unbreakable podcast is here to inspire just that. With motivating guests from all different walks of life and around the world, their stories will empower you to unlock abundance and your unbreakable spirit. Do you need accountability? Reach out to me for a free consultation of how I can support you in reaching your maximum potential. Hey everyone, it is Coach Des here, host of the Born Unbreakable podcast, and I am launching Born a Boss Babe 90 Day Transformational Program starting in August. And I'm looking for 18 to 24 year old young, confident women who are ready to step up and excel in life. What is the biggest difference of somebody like an Oprah or a LeBron James? It's having that mentorship and coaching. So if you're ready to supercharge your life, Hit me up, Des at bornunbreakable.com for more details. Welcome to the Born Unbreakable podcast. I'm your host, Coach Des, but today I'll be playing a little bit of a different role because it's a really special episode, episode 100. What a milestone. I can't believe it got here so fast. So the format is going to be that my partner in crime, Behind the scenes, podcast manager Aaron is going to be asking me questions today. Yes, yeah, stepping behind the shadows and get into the spotlight. <laughs> I, I I don't know how I feel about this, <laughs> but we're gonna it's, it's gonna work. It's gonna work. Uh, so for those of you out there that are used to Des's professionalism and her nailing it, this may this may go bad. <laughs> we may have a blooper right at the end of this. But 100 episodes. Yes. I mean, 100 seems like a good number. It's round, it's, it's three digits. It's, it's like a reason to celebrate. Yes. And now let's look back at episode number one and how that came about. Because <laughs> I know a lot of you that uh, watch and listen to Coach Des um, for 99 episodes, mm. you know, you, you get to hear about everybody else. And you get a little pieces of you. Yeah. But today we really want to figure out and get to know coach des mm -hmm. now born and breakable yeah. let's, let's start with the name before we go back to the beginning <laughs> of, of the podcast yeah where did born and breakable come from yeah born and breakable uh it meant a lot to me when i decided to rebrand and come out coming after a second pod uh, a first podcast that i did this is my second podcast because i did bliss beyond fear for 69 episodes with a partner. So this is my first solo podcast. And I made a list. I stayed up till probably two, three in the morning and there was about 50 names. And of course, Born and Breakable was like number 49 or something. I knew it had to mean something. It had to strike me. And part of what I thought about was my story and the different things that I personally have gone through and what I stand for. I have been through pretty difficult things like losing my dad when I was nine years old, going through divorce. And every time I had those challenging situations, I recognized that I was unbreakable. I, and I truly believe that we all are. And if you notice in the logo, uh, the B and the U are more pronounced because the message that I have for people is to be unapologetically you. I think that I spent a lot of my life wanting to please other people, make people proud, wanting to do the right thing. And it wasn't until I started going through some of the challenges in life that I recognized that the best version of you to be is exactly who you are and coming into your, into your own. And that's the platform that I want to celebrate. Now, you talk about losing your dad and going through um, divorces and everything. Mm -hmm. So... It would only be right that you would start out this podcast with some sort of, you know, <laughs> challenge, you know. So let's kind of go back to now. Now, this podcast episode wasn't just kind of put together because you wanted to do a podcast. Right. Your your last podcast show, Bliss Beyond Fear, yeah. stopped abruptly. Mm -hmm. And and this whole uh, Born and Breakable had to be done within a matter of 
like weeks. two weeks, two weeks, you know. Yeah. So it, it was. I know it was like for me and you. We we put to, put everything together really fast, so rapidly. But let's talk about that. Like the whole, your partner just pretty much quitting, throwing in the towel, like all of a sudden. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was abrupt. It, it really was. You know, I was excited because we were pretty far along. I mean, sixty nine episodes is a lot. We were building that brand for women specifically, finding joy and confidence uh, after you've poured into other people. So it was a really great thing that we built together, but she was having new horizons, you know, a new relationship, wanting to get closer back to her faith. And um, I understood that, you know, I think I took that with grace, but I, I also knew that for me, my calling is to serve. It is to be a student. It is to be somebody who is out there that is creating a space for people to grow together. It's always been within me to, to, to hold space like this and pay it forward. And so that is the reason I wanted to show the audience who started to grow with me already from the first show that I wasn't just going to take a month, like many months or a year to come back. I wanted to do it very quickly, but in a thoughtful way. So they knew that was another example of being born unbreakable, the ability to pivot, the ability to have resilience and to come back, if you will, even better than you were the first time. I learned a ton. You know, I said, well, what are all the, this is an opportunity to grow. What are all the things that I didn't get to do with my first show that I can do right out of the gates with, with this new show? video was one of the biggest things and that was why I reached out to you was because I'm like get the right skill sets to help you excel and to do this and I think it created another dimension because that's what everybody does today is they want to look up on YouTube who is it who's the face behind the voice so I wanted to be able to cre create additional intimacy for folks who Besides just listening, if they wanted to watch visually myself and any of the guests, they had the option to do that. So that was one of the, the big learnings that I had. Now, the Warren Brinkle podcast show, this is not your only job. No. <laughs> oh, my gosh. What, what is your what, what's 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 your main job or what are other jobs that you have? Oh, man, the list is long. I, I am trying to in my youth, which I, I still feel like I have, you know, to do as much as I can in the world while, while I have all my wits about me. But I would say that I spend the majority of my time doing consulting and coaching. So I do consulting in the healthcare space with executives to improve, you know, leadership in, in hospitals. And then I also do private coaching for people that want to really excel in things like life transitions. You know, I, I have a lot of experience in that because I have a certification in change management. I also have a certification in being an executive coach. Uh, and so I want to be able to use those skills every day. So I spend most of my time doing that. But, you know, I'm also an entrepreneur at heart. I, I cannot sit still. I always like to be creating and doing new things that fuel me. So, of course, you and I have started to get into the the real estate and rental operations space. So that's been really fun. And I, I think, you know, the next chapter for me is figuring out more programs that I can create to help people because I think the greatest joy that I've experienced in my, in my growth is what it feels like to help others. Mm -hmm. You know, pouring into yourself is where you have to start. I think, you know, doing that inner work is so important. But then once you can take it to a level of service when it's helping other people, that's when it really means something. No, but let's, let's touch on that. Because if you have a really good job, mm -hmm. you're able to pay your own bills, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Why do more work? I mean, why <laughs> not just go and just travel the world and take Instagram pictures? Yeah. Why not just do that? Why, why you know, add, add more businesses and keep, keep doing more? I mean, yeah. So a lot of people, they may seem like, wow, that's just... Why are you doing so much? Well, just enjoy life. Why, you know, you're a workaholic, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. You know, but there are some people mm -hmm. that, you know, like you, that just, that's what you, you working and, and, and keeping going. Like, you know, you want to do more. Mm -hmm. And it's a, uh, it's a very selfless thing because, you know, you have your job, but you're, now you're spending this whole, you know, other part of your life coaching, getting information from all these great people that you interview. Mm -hmm. And helping others. Yeah. 
So, I mean, like, why, why do all that? I mean, and, and I know for like a lot of people, especially young women, young men out there that maybe look to you for guidance, like, you know, why, you know, why do all that? Like, yeah. you know, is it, is it just something that you, because it's not for everybody. No. You know no, what I mean? I totally recognize that. But you, do you really <clears throat> love doing this? I, I don't look at this as a job because people ask me that question all the time. Yeah. Well, what, what's the purpose? Um, I don't look at the clock. I mean, I, I look at my calendar because it dictates what I need to do, but I don't go, gosh, is it four o'clock yet or five or six or seven so I could just stop. To me, you know, I I got to a point after I went through a lot of hard things, especially in relationships, of going, you know, what? how do you find purpose in the world? How do you really find your calling? And what does fulfillment look like? Because uh, you can have a lot of things, you know, and make money and buy cars and houses and all these things. But those, what I found personally is that it's temporary fulfillment. And what I, what I've always like wanted to strive for is how do you stay fulfilled Mm long-term? And for me, it's building a sense of community and why grow alone? Mm -hmm. You know, why not create a space? And, and, and my, my drive for that also comes from the environment that we're in. We're in a, in a state right now in our society and in the world where what's promoted is divisiveness. Every time you turn on the TV, you are having to debate something, you know, in your household with, well, are, are you red or are you blue? It's, and everything is choosing a side and putting yourself in a box. And I just believe and maybe it sounds, you know, a little bit too idealistic that we have a lot more in common than we think we do. Mm-hmm. I think striving for unity and harmony and togetherness and learning is the best way that we can combat all of this crazy negativity that's out there. So if I can contribute to that in some way and be fulfilled long term, then that's a purpose that I think is worth Fulfilling. Now, being selfless and helping others has always been a part of your life. Let's, let's kind of go back to where, you know, uh, being a teenager. What kind of things did you do as a teenager and in college and stuff like that in your early years? Yeah. What kind of things were you involved? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I was the ultimate uh, volunteer, you know. Uh, when I first was in school, I I, I thought I was going to end up being a dietitian and going into the clinical Um, part of healthcare. I ended up going on the operations side, but I volunteered for the community hospital. It was Washington Hospital in Fremont, California, and I did newborn photography. I worked in the medical resource library doing osteoporosis screenings, helping people find medical information in the library, and I worked for the dietitian of the hospital, handing out menus to patients. This is in high school? Yes, this is in high school. While you were uh, part of student government, right? Yes. Student council, all mm-hmm. that. Yeah, I was always in student government since third grade. So I, you know, I have been a public servant yeah. my whole life. That it's it's in my DNA. It wasn't something that just I woke up as an adult. It was, you know, when I was a kid, I was like, how can I, how can I be of service? And so it started once I joined student government at, in third grade at eight or nine years old. I have been doing it ever since. I did it in high school, all four years of high school. I did it all through college um, because it was my way to, you know, contribute to the to the society around me. Um, and then after uh, high school and doing those those vol- that volunteer work, um, I really wanted to do more um, to contribute to, like building houses. And so when I started working um, in in college, I did a bunch of different things. I started like a dance-a-thon to raise money for diabetes and the theme, the causes that I cared for because one of my values is fun. I always think that you should be having fun in life that you can't take things too seriously. So I did a lot of cool contributions like that. But when I got into my career, I I went and did Habitat for Humanity two times. I did one trip that was in Guatemala, um, and then I did another one that was domestically in St. John's in South Carolina, um, and then I started volunteering for the Red Cross. Um, and that, you know, it just—I think when you're of service, it reminds you 
the world is much bigger than you are. And I, I, I would, whenever I would make a big deal out of my own challenges, you know, like, oh, this is happening in my life. Why is this happening to me? When I would go to a place of service, it becomes not about you anymore. Now, I'm going to be a little shallow here and say that, like, if people are looking, especially younger people, mm -hmm. looking at you going, oh, my God, you, like, volunteered, you're in government, everything. You must have had, like, no friends and you were probably unpopular. <laughs> but surprisingly, you know, this surprised me, you were homecoming. No, prom? Oh, homecoming queen. Homecoming queen. Yeah, you had to get voted for that. So you had, so it, you know, it, that that's pretty cool. So a lot of you out there are going like, gosh, she probably had no friends. She's probably like, you know, her. yeah. She just <laughs> was by herself giving yeah. speeches. <laughs> and I say that because right now, for younger people, social mm -hmm. media is pretty is everything to them. Yeah. You know, getting the uh, um, the validation mm -hmm. that you're. That people like you, you know, I mean, likes are just everything to young people right now. Yeah. So, you know, the fact, you know, so it, it, it is cool to help and do a lot of stuff. And, you know what I mean? So I think I think it's very important. I say that because, you know, I want people to understand that, you know, you, you know, while doing all this, you know, it is still cool to, you know, to help. And you can also be the prom queen. You know, what I mean? <laughs> right. you know? Uh, and because I mean, that that kind of gets a lot of, you know what I mean? If, if you a lot of young people, they're wasting a lot of time on that, mm -hmm. you know, and they don't know how much they, how meaningful it is to actually go and help somebody else. Mm -hmm. And and I think, you know? you you know, when you're doing these kinds of things, it, it, it has to come from a place that you, you want to do it. See, when I was younger back in the day, you know, it was like my space and mm -hmm. I didn't even get a Facebook, I think until college, which was a long time ago. I didn't have a place to promote what I was doing because yeah. it wasn't about showing off what I was doing. It was about who, how I was growing as a person. And I think young people today are faced with for, for, for how our society is now that they have some sort of duty to show the world yeah. <laughs> through social media and your followers that you're doing things. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, to me, it's a double edged sword. Um, because I think there's a lot of good that social media yeah. does, but I also think it can be dangerous if it if it is not used in a. Which I kind of want to point out because I know you know if, if you're if a young people that are watching this are going like oh my god another older person tell yeah. me that I need to get off of social media, you don't have to get off of social media. It's it's a right. really cool thing. We all use it. I I think it's just knowing what is important. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like it's okay to have a social media and follow. And a lot of people make a lot of good living off of being influencers. You yes. know what I mean? But I mean I think you know uh, the longevity. You know what I mean? And maybe uh, and, and it, a lot of the effects of your personal life, you know, mm -hmm. um, if, if you can. You know, and, we'll, and we'll go back to this of mm -hmm. why, you know, you starting out so young, yeah. doing all these good deeds and volunteering has led to what you are today, mm -hmm. you know. And. Um, but now you're in your late 30s mm -hmm. and got some success. You know, uh, but recently you asked yourself if you can tell your younger Des 20 years ago, yeah, give her some advice, you know, what would you tell yourself? Mm -hmm. And I know you thought about that. And this is the reason why you created Boss Babe, this new program that you're doing, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's very important that people get to know you because, you know, there's a lot of people that are coaches now. There's a lot of people that are, you know, doing self-development and stuff like that to sell a book, to get, you know, right. to, to, to monetize, you know, make money. But I think it's very important people understand where you come from and why it's very important and why it's significant that someone like you is doing this program. Yeah. Because you come from a lot of stuff. You know what I mean? You, you learned from it firsthand. Mm -hmm. And... You know, so this this Boss Bay program, let's let's kind of talk about that. Like, why why is this important to you? And, yeah. and what what are, what are a couple of things that parents and young people can look forward to? Yeah, I mean, I have been thinking about doing something like this for a while, uh, and it finally just I was like, it's time. You know, it, mm -hmm. it is just it is just the right time 
for me to do this, for what I've learned, and you have to start somewhere. Uh, I've always appreciated academics, and I, I still today would advocate for those who you know want to go to higher education and learn to do that. I, I would not take back my college years. They were so formidable. What I wish I had, <laughs> though, was a college for life. Mm -hmm. The life skills, the curveballs, all the things that happen in an unstructured environment. I learned everything about what happens in the classroom and how you can apply your education to a career. But all of the, the, the biggest lessons that I've learned came from what was happening outside of that setting. And so that is the territory that I wanted to get into is to create more of a program that is holistic, that talks about life, mm -hmm. not just this pursuit of a career that you, you know, have to do. Which when you really think about it, you, you, you wonder why they don't have a class on marriage, finance, you know what I mean? A lot of these things, mm -hmm. relationships. I mean, they, I mean, relationships and money are a big part of our lives, but yet we don't have any classes. You know what I mean? Right. There's not, you know, you know, uh, oh, what are you taking this semester? Marriage one and finance one. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> like, yeah. You yeah. know, but but that unfortunately, those are the things that we don't have. Like, we don't have those classes. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure we would have break it down. There's a reason why. You know what I mean? I don't know. There's a lot of different viewpoints people have. And I'm pretty sure if somebody were to come out with a, you know, how to do a relationship course at a, at a university, <laughs> it'd be protested day one. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> it's going to offend somebody. But I mean, I think for the most part, a lot of these young kids coming into their own graduating right. college, high school, mm -hmm. are lacking some of the biggest lessons. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, you know, it's very good that you're doing this because, I mean, these are essential. Yeah. These I, are very I essential. Totally believe that. And that's the reason why I'm starting this. And, you know, according to psychological statistics, you don't become a technical adult until around between 24 and 26. And so what happens prior to that peak in your psych in your psychological development is vital. Mm -hmm. All the things that you're consuming, you know, in those years where you become an adult, according to our American society at 18, between 18 and 24, well, that's a really good absorption period to to learn about life. And so the program that I'm designing is covering relationships, finances, networking, including social media, mm -hmm. and health and well being, how we take care of our physical, mental, spiritual selves, and goal setting. You know, it's not something that you stop just because you decided to go to college. Well, well what about the rest of your life? What does that look like? You know, self-worth so those are the kinds of topics that we'll be covering in the program yeah and 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 we'll definitely get into a lot of them because i think it's very important um that you know any parents or or, or young people watching this they we they really get know what it is you're going to be talking about mm -hmm. because i think it's very important um that it so a program like this is not only for young people but i think it can also help a lot of parents out there because there's no manual <laughs> on how to raise a baby, a, an adolescent, a, a teenager, you know what I mean? Uh, a young adult, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of parents, uh, I mean, especially with YouTube right now, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, you know, people put a lot of information out there. Yeah. But now it's just become so much. I think this is really good because this is coming from somebody who uh, does coaching but not only that has actually lived through a lot of the things that mm -hmm. these people are going to face and, the, and let's face it when you when you turn 18 you're probably not wanting to get all the advice from your parents because yeah. you had to listen to them your whole life tell you what to do what not to do how to do it who to do it with where to do it all this stuff so at that point you're spreading your wings so you're looking to outside that's just how it is. Sorry, parents, if you're listening, you know, kids are looking for some of that out, those outside resources that they can look up to, um, to get inspired by. And that's part of the reason why as I'm designing each of the sessions that I'm going to have with these young people, because that the program is for 18 to 24 year old um, women, 
um, is experts, mm -hmm. having experts be involved. So this person studies relationships all day. This person does financial stuff all day. So these are people who can tell you very quickly what the pitfalls are, what to watch out for, all of those things that can give you that supercharge or that jump start so you can be more prepared for those situations in the world. And I mean, let's be honest. I mean, if, if you thought your child could make it in the NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball, hockey player, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and even maybe be somebody, you know, that's maybe a, a, a could be a, a really good doctor or lawyer. Mm -hmm. Those parents take those kids to camps when that's they're right. young. They, they hire professional athletes, you know. They, they, they get them into the programs. They get them interns. I mean, those parents that are really grooming their kids to be, you know, in the pros or, 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 or have those really top level jobs are doing, investing so much time in bringing other coaches. That's right. You know what I mean? Even, I mean, uh, I'm pretty sure even other athletes will hire other athletes, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Absolutely. To, to train their Look kids. At the Olympics, yeah. You know? And, and, and just because your kid is not going to be in the NBA or NFL doesn't mean you shouldn't give them that same opportunity as those same coaches. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like, you know, the, the average person, you know, still needs that, that good coach. You know what I mean? Yeah. Not, not, I mean, and, and a lot of people come to you in their 30s, 40s, 50s. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that, you know, you, you have an experience dealing with a lot of people in that age group. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, why not get to the beginning? Give these, give these people a chance to not make the same mistakes that we all do. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. that's really what it is. You know, I had to become a student of life before I could be in the seat of feeling I could, I could teach something. And I've spent the last 20 years in life school, you know, and I would love to have had the, the chance to have a program like this when I was younger, because I do feel like there's certain things that I could have done differently. Um, and now I can create that. Now I can create that for young people. Okay, so let's get into these topics then. And, and getting into these topics, we'll get to know more about you and how you had firsthand experience. The big one, the first one, relationships, you know? Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> is I think one of the, I mean, it's all around, you know what I mean? I mean it, it's what drives movies and stories and TV shows. And we, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's something that, that gives us a really good high and brings us to a really big low. Oh, yeah. So your relationships, two divorces, yeah. the first one, mm -hmm. when did you get married? What, your first love? Yeah. Yeah. I was 15. 15 years when old. When we got together. High school sweetheart. I was very, very much of the live by the Cinderella story. I thought that was life. You get taught. You find that Prince Charming, you hang on to him, you marry him, you do the white picket fence thing, and that is how you roll in society. Once you do those things, you will feel accepted, exceptional, and so I did. Yeah. So I did. So 15 years old, I found, um, I found well, he found me. <laughs> yeah. I am a believer that the men should chase you, um, but he did. So we met, and um, I was in high school, and we, we were together for a decade. So mm -hmm. after a decade, your first marriage comes to an end, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and in that moment of being how old you were 24, 25, I was 25, 25 mm -hmm. years old. So 25 years old. Now, for a lot of people, that's usually the age they're starting <laughs> yeah, exactly. to get married. You know what I mean? Um, um, and, and it seems like more and more people are waiting. But, you know, mm -hmm. depends on where you are in the country, the culture and everything. Absolutely. But, you know, at 25 you know, you're still, you're still pretty young mm -hmm. and already going through a divorce. Yeah. I mean, how is that? Not a good look. Yeah. I, I felt, I felt defeated. I felt like a failure. I felt embarrassed that I couldn't hold it together. Uh, you know, we were, I was 22 when we got married. So collectively it was a, you know, a decade, but we were married for three of those 10 years. And, um, it was devastating just because, you know, I don't, I don't think anybody gets married 
to get divorced. Mm -hmm. It's not like it's something they look forward to. Like, let me be a part of the statistic in um, society. So I wanted to commit suicide. It was, I just did not want to be in the world looking, looked at as being shamed because I also came from a Catholic family where you shouldn't get divorced. Yeah. Everyone before me, no matter what they were going through in their relationships, stayed in them. Whether they liked them or not is another question, but they stayed and they fought and they, you know, did the traditional Catholic thing to do. And so I was already a deviant. I was a deviant. So society. someone, someone, you know, you know, go, taking your program and you're going over relationships. Yeah. Are we telling them? Are we preparing them for divorce? Are we, you know, are I, we telling them that? You know, I mean, how harsh or how real are we getting or, or is it about that? Or is yeah. it just more about giving them a guidance? What, I, I think the first thing that is important about relationships is the relationship you have with yourself. Mm-hmm. That's that's I wish I spent more time developing that relationship and really nurturing it and having self-love. Because if I did that, suicide wouldn't have been my answer. Yeah. You know, I would have had the love for myself and who I am and my strength and my resilience to say, you learned a lot of things. Take these lessons and bring them forward. So relationships are about starting with yourself, knowing yourself, having that confidence in yourself um, and understanding what self-worth really means. So that as you walk into relationships, whether they're intimate and romantic or relationships that are professional, your friendships, also the the dynamics of another very important realm, which is your family. Mm -hmm. It changes as you shift from being a child or an adolescent to an adult, the dynamics and the tables start turning. The respect that you have, the way that you engage with other people, the knowledge that you have, it starts to to shift. And so there's, there's a lot of things to to reflect on and to grow in, um, you know, even outside of just romantic relationships. So then you get divorced. How a couple years later? Mm-hmm. Let's try it again. Give it another go. <laughs> give not? it another go. Just give it another go. Yeah, you know, when when I got married the second time, what it taught me was that life keeps going and you can love again. Yeah. I think heartbreak is devastating, no matter when it happens. Mm-hmm. Even if it's just a breakup, I mean, anybody who's listening right now can relate to that first devastating breakup that you had, where you felt like the world was ending, you just wanted to stay in bed all day, eat ice cream and just never come out, you know? And so it taught me, you can keep going, you can find love again. And, uh, you know, I was so caught up in in my second marriage of... Our, our, our connection was the, the, our, the brokenness that we had gone through of like, oh, you've been through this and I've been through this. So now we can go through life together coming out on the other end of, you know, maybe relationships that didn't work out. But what I was missing, because I don't know if anybody can relate who's listening, but I'm just like that person that falls hard and quick. And then it's like, it all work itself out. But I wasn't thinking about some of the other dimensions that we'll get to of like finances and yeah. well-being and alignment. I was missing the component of alignment and just assuming everything was going to fall into place because you love each other. Now you, you looking back at that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so let's take your perspective. Yeah. Now let's take maybe a parent's perspective. Let's say you're, you're coaching somebody and you're talking to a young lady about relationships. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> maybe a father would be like, you know, Coach Jess, tell my daughter not to get married until she's 30. You know what right, I mean? Right. But, I mean, are, are we are we telling young women that? Are we discouraging them from getting married? Is that something? Or, or, or are we just kind of telling them that, hey, you know what? You can get married at 18. You can get married at 30. I mean, but I mean, but is there some sort of tip to say to wait? Are we telling people that? Or are we kind of letting them choose? Part of, part of learning, as much as I know parents are going to hate hearing this, is asking questions because the mistake that we make is assuming that everyone's maturity and alignment is going to happen at the exact same time. Then we do that. We impose those things on people to say at 25, you should look, your life should look like this at 30. You should have accomplished this. 
And the damage that we're doing to people is creating a prescription or a recipe that may not fit, you know, everybody's lives. Because what about the person that doesn't want to get married? Yeah. What about that person? What about the person that has an alternative perspective on relationships and doesn't want commitment? Maybe they want to date multiple people. Is that person wrong? So this, this course, this program isn't to profess an edict of here's this belief system about relationships and you either have to just be monogamous, non-monogamous, be with the same religion. It's not professing any of that. It's really exploring the kinds of questions that help you to understand first and foremost who you are so that you can show up, going back to my whole motto of being unapologetically you, Mm -hmm. that you can be who you are and not just try to conform to either another person's view of what a relationship is or the people around you who have defined some sort of construct. It really is, this is an opportunity for you to get outside the classroom and get outside of your construct of learning in whatever environment that you did and take a hard, conscious look at what you actually think and feel. I want this to be a community where the person that says, I want uh, a marriage can sit and exist next to the person that says, I don't want one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and everybody else can want some other variety or flavor of that. And that's okay. And we can coexist together. Now, is there something that you felt you could have done different? When, as far as relationships. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, think more, yeah. more first. You know. what, what's the first thing that comes to mind when it comes to your first and second marriages? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think it was, it was the time, the time to get to know myself and those people better. I was, too, I felt too much of a, a need to fit a box and check it off. You know, I, that might sound a little bit simplistic. It's not like I just put a date on the calendar and said I have to do this by, you know, 22 or 25 or 30. But I did feel a sense of, you know, that we feel social pressure. We do. Mm-hmm. And it's worse with social media. Yeah. I mean, at least back in the day, I could just silently kind of look around and see what other people were doing. But today it's broadcasted all over the place. Mm-hmm. Oh, another marriage, another marriage, another baby, another baby. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're like, shit, I'm behind. Yeah. What the hell? Like, if I don't get on this, everyone's going to judge me for being an alien that didn't freaking find a partner and, like, start popping out kids, you know? Yeah. So I think time was something that I should have taken to really understand, like, what, what worked. And and also, you know, really seeing if the, if the what I wanted in the world long term actually aligned with this other, with this other person that I was going to make a long term commitment with. So once you go through the relationships, you know, part and you move on to finances. Yeah. So a young, you know, a young person. Now, it could be the, the young person that, you know, it could be the young athlete or the young woman or young man that, that gets success at a young age mm-hmm. or they don't have success. You know, um, finances. I know is a big part when it comes to, you know, relationships. Like That's one of the biggest problems. Yes. Finances. Uh, your friends, your family, you know, uh, a lot of people feel like they have to help their family out. You know what I mean? Some people feel like they don't have help from their family at all. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so let's talk finances here. I mean, because that's that's the, the next big, big one. Mm-hmm. You know. What was your financial road? What was from, you know, from when you were younger yeah. to now? Humble beginnings. Yeah. <laughs> Humble beginnings. You know, my father was an immigrant from the Philippines. He met my mom in Hawaii. They built their life, you know, little by little, brick by brick. And he joined the military and, you know, was was a servant to the country and just taught me to focus on education because education was going to be my ticket to a good job. So that, that was the path that I was taught. And um, I was taught to save you know, save money. If you don't, if you don't have too much of it, you know, you put it away and you, and you first focus on the college, because if you can get past that, then you can, you know, make more and then do more of the things that you want in life. So, you know, I was taught that at a young age. And then when I, I lost my father, he was that financial guide Mm -hmm. in the family. So that was missing a little bit that 
Oh, okay, well, well, now what do you do? I had to work because we didn't have a lot of money. So I worked all through college. I had to apply for scholarships, apply for grants, and I started working as soon as I was 18. I had to save up to pay for my first years. And every single year after that, <laughs> I was working um, almost full time, at least 30 hours a week when I was in school on top of a full load. I always took a full load of classes. I never was a part-time student. I was always a full-time student. And so I was just taught basically work really hard. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until later in college that I learned about other sources of income, like multi-level marketing, like mm -hmm. you can have a side hustle in addition to, you know, maybe a quote unquote day job. And so that was my first introduction to having multiple streams of income. And then, and then it was, you know, even later after that, that I started getting exposed to real estate and the stock market and what those things could do about like investing and how to, you know, make your money work for you better. Now, looking back, I mean, just like in the program, you're, you're, what are a, a couple of things that you think that you may have done wrong or you would want to help a younger person when it comes to finances? Credit. Credit. Yeah. <laughs> Manage it. Know what it is. Know how you get scored. You know, I, I would remember talking to girlfriends who had, a, you know, grew up wonderful upbringing, you know, didn't have financial struggles, but didn't ever create, build credit. So they were a lot later in life and had struggled with being able to do something like buy a car because there was no evidence that they had a financial track record. And so if you can understand what that is as soon as you're 18 and get a secured credit card with a limit and know how to manage that, then that's your first indicator to being able to manage more than that, you know, when it comes to like a loan or a higher balance credit card, and you can start building that and understanding um, what that actually means when you're trying to make bigger purchases like a house one day. Now you graduated from what college? UC San Diego. Okay, so mm -hmm. you graduate from UC San Diego right into an internship. Or you were interning while you were in college, right? Yeah, well, I I actually got my job for my consulting firm. I got the offer six months before I graduated. So you already had a job, a job waiting for you. So mm -hmm. um, first year, I mean, what, what's a round number that we're making? I was making $50,000. Okay, at what age? I was 22. Okay, and which was, you know, not that long ago. But Obviously. back then, <laughs> that was, was 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 kind of was was a lot for a, a twenty for that time. Yeah, 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 it was pretty decent. Yeah, you know. Uh, and now, how does that affect your relationships, your marriages, your you know? Now, yeah. obviously, over the years, it, it, it gradually went up. Right. But finances, you being a woman and and making the bread in the house, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? How does that affect your relationship? A lot. You know, it depends on obviously the, who you're with, your partner, what kind of relationship, and what kind of money they're making. You know, and, and just for perspective, that $50,000 today is like almost double for somebody that would be starting in the same position just for relevancy. But, um, you know, finances in a relationship in a household is, is, is important because it drives decision making together. And you have to make choices about whether you share your finances. Do you manage them independently? Do you put it all in one big pot? Is it like a free for all, you know, and understanding somebody's habits with money, with spending or saving or investing? Do you have the same money mindset? That's not really something that most young people are sitting there having a conversation with another young person about. And so for me, that was the farthest thing mm -hmm. from my mind. In my head, it was just like, well, if I'm making good money, it should all work out fine. But I wasn't spending enough time evaluating the, on the other side, the, my partner, mm -hmm. um, what, what truly was their situation? What was that going to look like long-term? How should we manage this together? I was just like, eh, it'll work out. It's fine. Now, are budgets only for people that make a little bit of money? No. I live and die by a budget. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I color code it. I update it regularly. But here's the thing. If you don't know where your money's going, 
that is usually how you end up with bad credit and make very poor decisions. Because I mean, a lot of people think here budget and they think, oh, budget. I mean, that's, yeah, that's right. because I don't have a lot of money, so I got to like count my pennies. You know what I mean? A lot of people think that. You know what I mean? Right. But I mean, a budget, I mean, you, some of the most wealthy people in the world. Absolutely. I mean, and, and it's to the point where it has to be managed by somebody else because there's so many assets and all of this money. That's why they, hand, uh, you know, hire a financial planner or advisor or a whole company or suite of people to look at those finances and make sure that they're making sound decisions. Um, so understanding your, your financial picture is going to help you to do something I think is important that not enough people really do today, which is to live within your means. Mm. You know, people are trying to keep up with the Joneses and yeah. now your bank account is suffering as, as a result of that. So, you know, you, 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 as a young person, you know, if you have your relationships, good. Mm -hmm. You're communicating, you know, you have your finances in order. Mm -hmm. The next thing, self-worth, mm -hmm. you know, what's, let's talk about self-worth because I'm pretty sure, like, and you've already mentioned this in your relationships, that kind of, you know, coincides. If you have self-worth, yeah. it'll help your relationships. But how is that, what does that mean to you looking back yeah. growing up? Oh, it's, it's managing your center because there will always be somebody who tests it whether it's in sports and someone tells you you suck mm -hmm. and, and maybe you do they could be right like maybe bad basketball wasn't meant for you but just because you're not that good at something doesn't mean your self-worth is now diminished and you can't do anything else you're gonna have to do some trial and error you know like don't try out for american idol if you don't have a good voice or something mm -hmm. like that but it shouldn't it shouldn't diminish your self-worth as a human being, your ability to try something and to learn and to grow from it. You know, your, your self-worth is something that you recognize that you can stand up after you've fallen or maybe feel like you've failed at something and that you can learn and, and, and also know that you're, you're not something that happened to you. Oftentimes we associate an experience, a trauma as a thing that needs to last forever. Well, oh, I got dumped. Now I'm just not worthy because that person didn't think I was good enough, pretty enough, smart enough. So I, I'm just doomed to failure for every other person that comes, you know, after this. Um, no, that's, that's not what that means. Now looking back, what would you say is like one or a couple of times where you felt like your self-worth was tested. Yeah. I mean, you know, I do, I do think that my first divorce was the biggest test just because up until that point, I felt like I was homecoming queen. I gave my college graduation speech. I'm a smart person and I can't freaking figure out how to make this work. What the hell? Like, yeah. it was the first time where I felt like there was this crossroads of I've been successful at these other things and I can't succeed at this thing. Why? And I beat myself up about that so much. Um, and that's, you know, that caused that, that, you know, suicidal depression, that kind of thing. And I was I was suffering in silence. I didn't want people to know that that was something I was going through. So. I was doing it privately and it wasn't until I was formally divorced that I actually was able to talk about it, that that was a decision that I made because I didn't want to get judged the whole time I was going through it. You know? mm -hmm. Now, I mean, if you look, if you look at somebody now, this, this, this boss babe program, mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of covers like your every person because I mean if you look on one one side mm -hmm. you have the person who's struggling failing all the time you know what I mean and you're trying to give them that like hey you have self-worth just keep going keep right. keep trying on the other hand you have somebody who never fails who's always winning mm -hmm. and I feel like when you're always winning you can't really learn how to lead until you learn how to fail mm -hmm. and sometimes you're preparing those people like yourself, who was just winning, 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 all of a sudden something comes and it's so, it's so devastating. Whereas the other person that says, well, I've been losing my whole life, like 
a divorce isn't a thing. I'm gonna keep trucking. You know what I mean? Right. But somebody who who's always had a lot of you know a lot of success. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, just gets hit with something devastating. They seem to take it really hard. Right. So th- this is not kind of this is. I mean, you helping women. It's you know young women. It can be for both sides. It can be the whole oh, spectrum. Absolutely. You know? you know because there's here's the you know the thing that people need to know is that we all experience the lowest low and the highest high. Mm-hmm. Life is just like that. It's yeah. it's it's never just like, oh, we're coasting. Because once you get to that that coasting, some curveball is going to happen. Mm-hmm. And there's an up or there's a down. So, it, you know, we're all going to be at one end at some point. So then how do we create the resiliency to be able to bounce back better, stronger, faster? That's that's what it is. All a coaching is about mm-hmm. is about not staying and and in these places, but just knowing where how do we adjust. So that's that's that really the the goal. Now, your relationships. You know, you you have your relationships. You got your money in order. You're you're doing your budget. You know, you're able to look at yourself in the mirror and say, "I love you." you know? <laughs> Now let's let's talk about goal setting. Now goal setting, I think is this is where I think a lot of people either sink or swim, because if you can't set a goal and and, and finish it, mm-hmm. now and it doesn't have to be a big goal. I'm mean, talking about little goals. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think I think in life when we're taught at a young age to complete something, to finish something, you create your condition that person to see things through. Right. And it's very surprising that even some people that are older still have problems setting goals and even seeing them through right so you looking back i mean how has goal setting i mean have you always been a goal setter have you finished everything that you set out to Mm -hmm. i mean what's what were some of the hard lessons that you learned setting goals yeah i learned that goals are are not just the big ones you know and initially it was like go to school that was a goal (laughs) you know it was just Mm -hmm. everything was like a big a big goal and as I got into the work world, you know, the professional world, it was that you do you do set small goals because it's those it's those stepping stones that get you to to the big thing. So like now, you know, if, if I fast forward to the current day in, in my mastermind, which is something that I've chosen to do for continuous development is being able to every year. In my group, we talk about four rocks. Like, mm-hmm. what are what are the four rocks that you want to accomplish this year? And and you know, so like somebody might say, buying a house, you know, or paying off a loan or something like that. But it's tangible. There's a timeline that's attached to it. If you know, you just Google right now, smart goals. It's a wonderful rule to follow. It's just ba- making sure you have realistic goals that you can measure, and and also knowing that. Things are going to shift and change and, and you revisit it. Mm-hmm. You know, so I started to um, after college when it wasn't like those big goals anymore. I started doing uh, goal setting instead of New Year's resolutions. So instead of saying like, the, oh, I'm just I'm going to lose, you know, 10 pounds or whatever, <laughs> like a lot of people weight is like a big thing. Um, I was like, well, let me look at the different areas of my life and set a couple of goals instead of just a new year's resolution. Let me make this really more applicable to more than one area of my life. Was there one goal growing up that you set out that you didn't accomplish? That's a good question. Mm-hmm. No. no. <clears throat> I th- I th- and I think because when you're intentional, you find a way, you find a way to do it. And that's the purpose of a goal is because you you set a target. And even if the target moves, you still have your eye on it. So just because, you know, you didn't buy that house as fast as you wanted to, maybe it is going to take you another year or something like that. But if you have your eye on that prize, you will figure out a way to, to get it done. Now, there's a lot of people that are probably watching that are, if they're being real with themselves, a lot of people out there saying, well, yeah, there's a lot of goals that I set out that I didn't accomplish. Like, did, why, did, why, why did you though? Yeah. Well, do you, did, I mean, here's you, did you want it bad enough? Mm-hmm. Cause sometimes we, we, people create goals for the sake of creating a goal because it sounds good. It mm-hmm. sounds good to other people, but the, the truth of the matter is for the things that you want most, 
you will make an effort to do it. And if you didn't accomplish it, it probably wasn't that important to you. That's what I would tell that person. If they were like, well, you know, I wanted to write a book or I don't know, whatever, whatever that thing may be. If it didn't happen, you weren't passionate about it enough or didn't utilize the right resources to, to get the job done. Okay, so the last uh, two categories in your Boss Bay program, networking and continuing education. So networking, mm-hmm. you, I, I hear you talk about like uh, in your past, past episodes yeah. of your product of the people around you. Yeah. How important is that? It's, it's, it's so important. You know, I just, I love the Jim Rohn quote that you are the, you know, you're at, you're the sum, the, the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. Now has your circle of people changed? How, how different was it from so when you were younger <laughs> to now, you know? It's expanded tremendously. You know, convenience and comfort, there's a reason that it's called comfort mm-hmm. is because you coast. You don't have to do anything different. When you get uncomfortable, that's when change happens. Yeah. That's where growth happens. And so, and this is not a knock for anyone listening to say that your high school friends aren't awesome or your elementary school friends aren't the friends, they could still be your best friends today. Mm-hmm. It's to say you're only going to go so far if everyone around you is from that isolated experience that you had in your life um you know unless you're the rare person that got to spend your entire life traveling and you were going to school in all these different places meeting all these people you know maybe there's a unique experience somewhere for somebody in the world like that but by and large people have a a fairly uniform you know growing up and having a certain set of people around you now are we talking about like you know your circle of people Mixture of family and friends. Yeah. Is it should your circle of people be small? Should it be big? So you're you're by okay. So there's your default. There's the default group that you have. Those are your family and friends that you grew up with. As you mature and you get older, you're selecting. You had you get to design mm-hmm. the group around you. You don't design your default. They're just there. Yeah. <laughs> you just land with those people. And, and there's probably a wide variety of people that eh, they may not do too much for you. And then there's some that are like, oh, my gosh, this person has been such an, a magnificent influence in my life and a bunch in between. When you are in a position to design that group, you know, one of the things that that uh, in my first podcast show, my partner and I talked about was the, this idea of of savers. Mm-hmm. And following this philosophy of somebody who supports you, aligns with you, value adds to your life, elevates you, and rises with you. It's hard to find somebody that does all of those mm-hmm. things. There might be that person that's like, oh, good job. You do that. But they're not doing anything with their life. That's cool. You still need that cheerleader, that person that's going to go right on. You do that, and I'll just be sitting right here. There's a different level of influence for that person that's a go-getter too. That's they're mm-hmm. doing some different things with their life and they're maybe encouraging you and challenging you. Like, damn, you're you running another marathon? Ah, oh, man, that's cool. I should try that with you. There's different levels of influence around you. And I think it's important when you are in the designer role and you're getting out of that default role that you're making conscientious choices about people who are going to bring you and stretch you to different levels, financially, intellectually, socially, in all of those different arenas where we want to But go. if you ask a lot of people, mm-hmm. a lot of people will say they still have that hot mess friend that they've been holding <laughs> on to for 30 years that just always comes around, you know what I mean? You just can't get rid of them, I mean. Yeah, you know, it's and, and here's the thing. I, I, I love this analogy. I, I heard this from uh, Karamo Brown um, from, from this show that he has, and, and he was talking about how not everybody needs to be in the front row seat of your life, right? When you walk into a theater, there's the front row, there's the middle, and there's the balcony. Those balcony seats that are way over there, you know? And you don't, there's some people that you have to create boundaries with because they take more energy from you than they, than they fuel. 
So when you're building these networks and these, you know, this and all of this stuff ties together, by the way, like these are not topics that are in isolation. Part of the purpose of this program is to recognize how we connect the dots because networks, what are they? Relationships. Yeah. And they influence what? Your health, your wellness, your finances. So the purpose of a network is to bring all of these things together into fruition to make sure that all of these cylinders can keep moving mm -hmm. in the direction that you want. So you have to be able to choose the people that can fuel that or they can deplete any of those areas. Now, was this challenging growing up? You going to high school and college, did you have those friends or people in your life that maybe brought you down that you felt like you had to get away from? Were you able to get away from them? Yeah, I mean, some of it, some of it was, you know, friendships that weren't serving me. And that's why I don't have those friendships anymore, for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, is, there, is there somebody that sticks out that you're just like, <laughs> that got, that was thank awesome. God, yeah, yeah. Thank God I got rid of that person. Yeah. You know, I mean, some of it was a natural shifting away because priorities just changed. And, and so I think that happens a lot for everybody. It, it's not like personal mm -hmm. where somebody just had to do something really shitty to you. And then now they're not in your life. I think people, some people just grow apart. Um, but sometimes there is that relationship that after a while you're like, this is pretty one-sided. Mm -hmm. Is it tough for someone like you? Because you're a very selfless person. Oh gosh, yeah. <laughs> you're a very nice person. You know what I mean? Has it been difficult to get those people maybe not necessarily out of your life, but mm -hmm. as the kids call ghosting them? You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, and I, I'll, I'll full disclosure, because we all have things to work on because of exactly what you're pointing out. I'm a person who has had to work on people pleasing and, and, and I still work on it. Yeah. It's, it. This isn't something like, oh, I read this book and I'm done. I still have to very conscientiously work on people pleasing and boundaries. Mm -hmm. So I had to, to, to start reading books, talking to my therapist, talking to other people who have less challenges and surrounding myself with people who have a tougher skin, who have no problem with confrontation. That's why I go to you with a lot of things of like, oh, I don't know how to deal with this. Um, give me some feedback where I go to my sister because she's one of those no nonsense people. That are, Whatever. You just hurt people's feelings sometimes. And I'm like, what? Yeah. Oh, that's sad. Right. So yeah. I have had to absolutely work on those things. And it was very hard to walk away from certain relationships. Um, but I, I had to make those choices sometimes when it got to a certain point. And I had to go out and seek what I was missing in terms of networks. You know, that's why I'm in a mastermind. That's why I love reading books. And, 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 and make no mistake, this isn't about like spend all this money to get all these influential people around you. Use the free shit too. Mm -hmm. YouTube, podcasts, like they're free. Yeah. That is something, access that... I didn't have, I had to, I mean, I had certain research, but you, it was harder to get to. I had to physically go to a library, get the book, read the book, bring it back, make copies. I mean, shit, people don't have to yeah. do that today. Well, you, you then that's Google. a good segue into our next thing, continue education. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, continue education, let's just put out some of the greats out there, yeah. you know, that everybody recognizes. Michael Jordan, yeah. Kobe. Yeah. Um, Oprah. Steve Jobs, yeah. Oprah, you know, these people kept learning, you know, and, and I think uh, when we look at people like that, they just go, well, this person was just born great. You know what I mean? Like they didn't have to really do much. They were just blessed. Mm -hmm. You know, how important is it for people to know that you're always going to have to keep you're always going to have to learn mm -hmm. and keep learning? Yeah, it's, you know. It's how you continue to expand your perspective in the world. Part of it, I mean, I'll just be blunt. A lot of the issues that we face in this society and in this country and in the world is because of lack of education. Lack of education that creates conversations that are not intelligible because people are not coming with facts, they're not coming with, with research, and they are not coming with the right tools and resources to, to have productive, healthy conversations. So education is everything. To me, it's, you know, the difference of my personal view of why a lot of things have not gone well. 
in, in our country because there's a lack of it and people are not prioritizing taking the opportunity to learn more about the issues and topics in our country and in the world. So yeah, it's, it's so important to, to make those choices to go to credible sources and find information that continue, continues to help you um, be a contributor to society. Now, what made you wanting to, I mean, because there's a lot of people that, you know, they say college isn't for them. You know what I mean? And that's okay. Um, but for for people out there that feel like, look, I went to school, I don't need to learn anymore. Yeah. I mean, do you, what do you say to those young people out there? I mean, but I mean, because for you, you, yeah. you kept going, you went to college, went into a firm, you're always having to certify and recertify and do all this stuff. You're mm-hmm. continuing learning. You, you like learning. Right. There's a lot of people that just, I mean, yeah. maybe they like to learn in a different way. Yeah. You know, I think, I think everybody, I'm pretty sure everybody, I mean, even if you're a crackhead, you're going to learn how to, do you know, something. yeah, yeah. You're going to learn how to get high. You're going to learn, you're going to learn something, Right. you know, but I mean, how, how do you motivate somebody to, to continue their education? Yeah. I mean, it's. Part of it is asking how, how you how do you want to show up in the world, and I do think that's where personal choice comes in. I recognize that not 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 everybody's going to sign up for a boss day person to be you know program to be a better person, mm-hmm. you know because maybe that's just not where their their effort and their energy uh, they want they want to put that. But I do think that if we if we all just sit here and ask ourselves a simple question of how do we want to contribute positively to the world around us, nobody can argue that that um, requires some level of learning something new. And um, so it, it doesn't have to look the same, but I think making some kind of commitment to, to say what does that look like for you is a start. Whether it is a book or a podcast or a community of people, you know, that's, that's teaching you new things, there's different shapes and sizes, but at, at least ask the question because I, I don't think that there's a day where we just get to drop the mic and say, I'm out, I'm done, I know everything that I need to know, and that's it. Because at that, at that point, if somebody makes that decision, then to me that's basically saying that you, 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 you're stuck growing, like you're finished, <laughs> you know? Okay, so... Now, getting into the Boss Bay program, going back on your life and everything that we learned today, yeah, you know, you you went through it, lost your dad at nine, had to work, pay for your own college, got divorced, you know, you 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 had to you you went through it, those things in your life that you can say forced you to grow up, be mature, to be resilient. Mm-hmm. Now, there are a lot of kids where they have both parents, they have the means, they have all the support, they have all the positivity, you know, they, they have the money, the resources to, to do a lot of stuff, mm-hmm. you know? A lot of people think when you need a coach, it's because you are lacking, you know what I mean? But in some cases, there's maybe somebody that just has abundance of stuff and just doesn't hasn't gone through that. So when they get into the real world, mm. it's hard for them. You know what I mean? It's like, wow, like my well, how come my boss doesn't love me? You know yeah. what I mean? Like why why aren't people, you know, paying me what I think my value is? You know what I mean? I, I think that that and, and and this is why I think this program is really good and it's important for people to, to know who you are. Because a lot of times parents, they're, they're going to want the best for their kids. They're going to do everything they can to give them their, their kids a better life than they did, to not struggle, to not go through that. And that's, that's fine. But there are, those, there are those parents out there and those kids that, you know, just because you didn't, you know, bad things didn't happen to you, you know, um, doesn't mean you, didn't, you don't need a coach. You know, I think I think this is very important for people to understand that, you know, even if you, you know, this could be for somebody that maybe lost their parents, you know, um, they don't have a lot of money and then they're just trying to find motivation, how to stay, 
you know, on track, you know, keep their eye on the prize. Mm-hmm. And then there's some people out there that may, that they may need that kind of gut check reality. Some mm-hmm. somebody to, other than their parents to say, this is how things are really are. Make sure you have the actual tools. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, how how important is it for you to make sure that you know you're that this that that people know this is not for just one person one kind of person right you yeah. know uh you know going back to what i said previously we we have those ups and downs you know congratulations if you're a person that that grew up in a stable household that you were taught a lot of things that maybe others didn't have the opportunity to learn uh but i think the thing to remember is there's your world and then there's the world around you yeah this program is about making sure that you understand the world around you and how the way you show up influences and impacts that. Mm -hmm. So it almost doesn't matter (laughs) whether or not you were poor or rich or had resources or didn't because those people are gonna collide in the world somehow, some way. And the more we have a greater sense of awareness about all of that diversity, then we can show up and be more dynamic individuals to deal with all of the things that you're describing. Mm-hmm. Because that's the, that's the heart of it, is recognizing that not everybody grew up the way you did. Not yeah. everybody has your story, good, bad, or you know, in between. It's everybody has a story. And if we can spend more time trying to understand the human experience, we can impact it in a positive way. Now, I think one thing that's really good too is that you're not only giving a lot of these young women tools, but you're allowing them to be in a group setting mm-hmm. where they can actually see each other's perspective. Right. You know, I, I think that's a very big, big thing. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's maybe how a lot of people learn. Because I think, you know, when you're 18, 20, I mean, that, that age, 16 to 22, you know, you know everything. Nobody can tell you nothing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You, you're not going to, you know, it's like, you know, you, your mom comes home and says, oh, you know, I want you to be part of this program and learn from this coach. It's like, oh, a grown-up that's going to tell me, you know what I mean, stuff. how to do stuff, you know. <laughs> I think it's really hard, but I think it's really good you doing this. And, you know, you're, you're not just preaching to them. You're not just telling them what to do, but you're allowing them to be in a group setting where they can maybe see each other's perspective. And I think that's really mm-hmm. good. Vulnerability. Yeah. Now, born and breakable, boss babe. You know, let's let's think for a moment. Does it mean something to you when somebody else that you've coached tells you, "I now feel like I'm born and breakable"? Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, I had so many moments. I'm going to start crying right now, you know, because I'm, I'm reflecting back to the different people that I've had coaching experiences, you know, happen or even guests that see the title of my show and start to tell their story and recognize their own moments and maybe even cry because I think we under, I think we underestimate our power. Mm-hmm. We underestimate our power. And this is a place where I want people to harness their power because too often and I'm, you know, this isn't me getting on my, my like feminist pedestal or something saying like female power, you know, I'm, I'm all for that, but this is really just, you know, saying as a human being, as, as still, unfortunately living in a world where women have to work a little harder, raise their voice a little higher, you know, put themselves out there so they can have a seat at the table, do the whole Sheryl Sandberg lean in thing, you know, yeah. we, it's, it, it, we have we have to do these things. We must do these things. To me, it's a requirement that we show up and do these things and come together in community because a we're stronger, you know. There we're stronger together than we are apart. We're stronger in collaboration and vulnerability and being open minded and sharing our ideas and feelings and thoughts than you know, pointing the finger at somebody because they have a different upbringing or because they have a different opinion or perspective, or because, you know, you're Republican and they're a Democrat. Like, 
you have to be able to see past those things mm -hmm. to humanity. And that is the, you know, the ultimate bigger thing that's coming out of this is, is how to create the, the kind, those kinds of dynamics. I think it's good to point out too, because I, you know, people, when they're, you know, writing a book or putting a program out, you know, the marketing and the name, they're trying to just grab people. So I think it's, you know, this name, you know, it's really good when somebody else says it back to you, that it affects you mm -hmm. because you can kind of see that, you know, what you sought out to do is try to give those people that, the advice and tools and just the tips, you know, give it to them when they're at that, that age, yeah. you know, when they're, they're just starting off is very important. Now let's kind of go fast forward here because we're running out of time. Yeah. What are the who are the top three influencers in your life? Oh my gosh, um, you know my my sister is a huge huge influence to me um, because she is a one consistent person for no matter how many stupid choices <laughs> I've made and and crazy things that I've done, she's always been there. She hasn't judged. She's always been encouraging. And I, I appreciate and I, I, I just I value that, you know, so, so tremendously. Um, I think that the at this time, the mastermind that I've been a part of for through the entire pandemic has been a place where uh, each of those individuals. And if you're listening, and you know, you know exactly who are it's led by April Garcia. She, she's the host of the Pivot Me podcast and just this, a tremendous human being um, has, has shown me the, the power, you know, of community. And, and, and you know, it, it kind of shows the whole network thing of you, have, you can have your family <laughs> and then you can have your, you know, uh, your design. That was something I designed. This is somebody was a default, but it was a lucky one. It was like a good one. You know, and, and honestly, I'll, I'll say the, the, the close friends and I, and I don't mean to just be like, oh, you're just grouping them together, but the, it's the, it's a circle of people, you know, you're one of them. Um, my friend Donna, my friend Monique, my friend Katie, Lindsay, you know, these, these are people who have, have weathered the storm, you know, with me. So I, I think that spectrum of your family, your friends, and those people that you have to work a little harder to figure out. You know what you're missing, so you can get it. Um, has been the you know fulfillment of my my influence. Very interesting because I you know when you usually ask people that you hear people that are like you know celebrities or, or you know um, um, you know uh, oh, political Oprah, figures. Obviously, <laughs> Oprah girl, yeah. if you're listening, yeah. you've changed my life. So hey, if you want to come on my show, totally. Now I I know I mean I know we're limited in time, and you know I didn't get to get into like the juicy stuff of you know like what's your favorite food, what do you do on the weekends, and stuff like yeah. that. But hopefully we'll do this you know uh, again yeah. and maybe get into that all the all the all the fun stuff. But you know it was very important that we talked about this and for people to understand because you're always interviewing people. Yeah. Um, but it's good to you know for people to get to know you so yeah. they know you know who is you know born unbreakable, what you're about. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's good to know. Uh, to kind of humanize you, because I think that's mm -hmm. very important. I, I think when you hear somebody that you uh, that you follow on the daily or or weekly or, or you go for inspiration, when you uh, learn that you have stuff in common, that mm -hmm. they've had the same struggles as you do, you mm -hmm. feel like, hey, I, I think it's more comfort. You feel like that person's a a, a close friend, you know, yeah. for lack of a better word. So um, I know I wish we had more time, know, but you know, this is, this is so much fun. This, this is just the beginning. This yeah. is just the beginning. You know, I, I recognize I get a lot of questions because people are like, Des, we want to know about you. And if you so, want to know, hit her up on social media. <laughs> She's an open book. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and maybe we could do like a, like a Q&A from your audience. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's some questions that your audience wants to know. Yeah, so so sure. we'll, we'll definitely do that. Um, but this was fun. Thank it was, you. it was fun. Um, 100 episodes. Let's, you know, let's try. Let's it. go to 200. Yeah, you know? let's do it. And you know. in a couple of years, we'll be at the thousand episodes. You know, we'll see where we're at. Um, but if you guys want to learn more, please go to uh, bornandbreakable.com. You can find all of Des's links there and mm -hmm. everything. Um, you got a new blog. I got a new blog. That's good. That's good. That's good. And, um, but yeah, if, uh, if there's anything that you guys want to know uh, about the uh, Boss Bay program, yeah. it's on there. Uh, yeah. I know you're, you're launching that. Yeah, uh, you can reach out to me. Just send 
said, shoot me an email. You can DM me on Instagram at Born Unbreakable or Dez at BornUnbreakable.com. And I just want to thank everyone, honestly. Yeah. I mean, at 100 episodes, I know I do this at the end of episodes. I just want to thank you for being on the journey with me. This has been um, crazy. It's been a lot. Um, so, I just, yeah, thank you for being here. Thank you for everything that you do for the show. And um, subscribe if yeah. you haven't already. And, and, and one last thing, we're taking a little break. So you won't see us for a week because we're taking a little summer vacation, but we will be back in a, in a week. So, And that's it. Barn Breakable Podcast Show. Coach Diz. Yeah. We are out.